up. Right now he's Roba doing Terry Funk in a bionic elbow. Sends him right out of the ring. Well, first of all, I never finished the ninth grade, okay? And I left Thomas 15 years old. I've been on the road ever since. All my life, depending on myself, never depending on anybody. And I look at wrestling, what an education wrestling was. How you can manipulate people. Manipulate the boys. You can manipulate any, your wife. You manipulate anybody. You learn that through wrestling. When you stand, when you're in a ring, you can make people sit. Sit at ringside, boring, because you get in a hole and you just stay there. You can make them scream, stand up. Some of them are even ready to come in the ring. Old ladies come at you. Here's an old lady never cussing in her life. Now she's sitting at ringside and she's cussing. Think of the power. That, to me, that's great power. That's really an eye opener in my life. I said, wow, this is professional wrestling. Because there was nothing but bullshit from the beginning to the end. There's nothing real about it. Politics is basically the same way. I'm 61 years old. And I look at politics. Every election, it's the same story. Just to different, uh, a different face, a different candidate. Uh, but it's the same story, over and over and over. And people buy it. Actually, the, the, the population of the whole entire world is stupid. And I don't mean that as an insult. I don't mean because I'm part of it. How many times have I been stupid that I buy something on, on TV that don't work? And then I'm too shy to send it back. So somebody's going to rip me off selling garbage. And then this still goes on. People buy, buy, buy. You know, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, here's this guy washing his house with his pressure washer. That was one of the gimmicks I bought on TV. It didn't work. You know, the thing was leaking, water was everywhere, you know. But back to wrestling. Wrestling is what educated me in life. Great education. You know, you learn to negotiate because the promoter, is, a lot of them were crooks. You know, well, crooks. I say crooks. They were there to make a living. And if they can get you for a certain price, well, you're probably worth five times more. Well, if he can get you for five times less, as a businessman, he will. But wrestling teaches you a lot of how to manipulate people, how to handle people, how to do things. And, and, and throughout my life, I used that, that experience. Uh, and there's no replacement. I could have went to college. I could have finished high school, went on to college. And, uh, and I would have never learned what I learned in wrestling. I know one business venture that you tried is you, you owned a car lot, I think, in the Charlotte mm -hmm. area. How, how did some of the wrestling lessons you learned there apply to your, your business as a car lot owner? Well, uh, again, I, I went into a business that I didn't know anything about it. And lucky I owned the land and the building, and I was successful. I, it was too much work. I was flying, and I was gone all the time. I didn't, I didn't have time to run a car lot. I had somebody else running it. And uh, eventually the guy had a heart attack, couldn't, couldn't work there anymore. And it was too much work for me, so I lease it. I lease the building. But it was an education. <laughs> you go into a business and uh, you, you learn to deal with the public, you know? Yeah, you, you ever heard a car salesman, if his lips are moving, he's lying. Well, that's basically politics. It's the same way politicians' lips are moving, he's lying. You know, the only time they ain't allowed to lie is when they're asleep. The guy's laying on his back, he's asleep, he's not lying. You know, it's like stories in wrestling. You know, you, you play a story. Look at wrestling today, it's even 10 times better. Because uh, the old time promoters didn't have the foresight, I guess, to see what, what could be done with wrestling. Promoters used to say, oh, we can't do this, we can't do it. Well, push the envelope, push it. You know, they didn't want to do that. They always wanted to stay at the same, kind of the same level. A few started experimenting. I remember Roy Shires in California. He wanted high spots, high spots, high spots. You know, that's all he wanted in wrestling. 
a lot of the other promoters say, ah, he's going to fall. You know, he's going to fall on his butt. You know, he's not going to make it. That's, people don't want to see that. Well, it turned out people wanted to see it, you know. I don't know if you know the history of when he went to San Francisco. And, you know, Pat Patterson was there. And, you know, the guys made a fortune. It was a different type of wrestling. A lot of high spots. You know? And he used to tell the guys, I want five high spots, minimum. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. That uh, the old time, you, you went to Florida, you know, and tell Eddie Graham that, then you know he wouldn't have he wouldn't have agreed with it. You know, Eddie Graham was different. He wanted some wrestling. You know, he would, the more you wrestled, the better it was. That's why you had Briscoe, the Funks. You know, well they could wrestle for an hour and never throw a punch, mm -hmm. never kick, and people would be standing. Uh, and even today, you got people that never understood I was done. You know, never understood I was done. And I, I remember there. Was, uh, I imagine uh, uh, Funk Jr. and Briscoe were probably my favorite matches to watch. Uh, you, you competed in wrestling for, for nearly 30 years. 30 years, yeah. Do you have a way? I, it's easy 30 years later to look back and say there's a right way and a wrong way of doing wrestling, but it sounds like you're pretty open ended in that there's a lot of right ways to do it. Well, there's a lot of guys in any business that don't know what they're doing. They're just there, they're bodies, they're warm bodies. That's what a lot of promoters used to call him. That's a warm body. Just put it in the ring. You know, he's breeding, you know. And they just wanted a body. And there were some guys that had great bodies and couldn't, couldn't function, couldn't wrestle. They couldn't walk without tripping over themselves. Look at the post office. Post office workers. You know, there was real matches with a gun, you know. Boom, 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 you know. Well, in wrestling, you had characters that didn't get along, and, and they got into it in the dressing room. But in the ring, now, i never seen... The only time I've seen real wrestling matches in the ring is, uh, I've seen a few where they, they would take a local guy and, and wrestle. You know, that was real, because the guy had to beat him. You know. Otherwise, the wrestlers would have looked bad. You know. Some local guy, tough guy, wanted to wrestle, and uh, usually they did it before the matches started. So there was very few people in the audience, and hardly anybody ever seen it. And of course, the guy didn't stand a chance. Uh, of course, he walked in the dressing room and there was 20 guys there. There was probably one or two that just could wrestle. The rest couldn't wrestle. So they put it against the guy that could wrestle. You know, this is, you know, people didn't realize that out of 20 guys in the dressing room, 18 of them, the average guys in the street could beat them. You know. <laughs> I mean, come on. I was going to ask you this story later, but there's a, there's, a, there's a story floating around there that a couple of years ago you wrestled on an independent show in Fayetteville and, and your opponent, I, I don't know if you just disagreed with him or I guess he was... It ended up, and you ended up breaking his nose, and and a lot of people thought it was just because you didn't really like uh, how he approached wrestling, or I guess how he approached your match. Do you remember anything specifically about that one? No, no, no. Well, I, you know, uh, in wrestling, you had guys that were considered stiff guys. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can, you know, I've always, I, I probably belong in that club. You know, uh, if you're going to hit somebody, hit them. And if you complain, you don't belong there. That was the old school of wrestling. Today, it's, today you, it's not even necessary to do that. In the old days, there was a lot of places you went that the promoters loved that kind of wrestling, rough wrestling. You come out of the ring with a bloody nose. And I mean, not mangled and stuff, but, you know, so what? You got a bloody nose. And, you know, you bust, busted your head or, you, you know, you got a black eye once in a while. You know. I wrestled I wrestled Ric Flair. and we'll be, I split his chest. And this is a fact. I, I hit him so hard that his chest had about five or six places where it was split. He never complained. But, okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, then I wrestled, uh, it was the, the Four Horsemen. This is a true story. Uh, I wrestled the Four Horsemen. Every one of them. You know, Arn, never complained. Ah, you stole, and you know, we'd whack each other. I mean, you know, we didn't try to bust each other's nose and cheat, cheat. Huh? But I'm talking about, you know, almost as hard as we could in the chest. And I mean, just nobody ever complained. And uh, I wrestled, uh, what's his name? Lex Luger. Well, Lex was a big guy, you know, compared to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was 230 pounds and five foot. Ten and a half, I stand on my toes maybe. <laughs> no, five ten, five ten and a half. You know, two hundred and thirty pounds. 
Yeah, like, I don't know, 6'3", 4", I don't know, I can't remember. The guy was about 260 pounds, 270, I, 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 something like that. Anyway, big guy, ex-football player, playing in Canada. I wrestle him. And one day, I wrestle him one time. And Crockett calls me in the office. This is a true story. And I don't know if it's, this is Jimmy Crockett telling me this. Jimmy Crockett says, can't book you with Lex anymore. You heard him. Well, that's incredible. You know, that somebody would, I heard him. The other three guys never complained. <laughs> I remember one time I loosened Tully's toot. You know, I, I punched him in the mouth, you know. And I, I either broke his tooth or, or chipped it or something, you know. Because I, I heard of it 20 times after that every time I run into him, you know. You owe me a toot, you know. <laughs> but that was wrestling, you know. And it's all part of it. And, but there were some guys that just didn't, didn't belong there. You know, they belonged in the movies where there was no contact. They had stuntmen doing it, you know. Well, in wrestling, it's pretty hard to have a stuntman, look like stuntman and go out in the ring and do you do your stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but you got to do it yourself. So, uh, yeah, it's incredible. It's like any other business. You got mechanics that don't belong to be a mechanic. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They got doctors like that. I don't know how they pass the test, but you got doctors that'll kill you in life. It's been known, mm -hmm. you know. So you got that in any profession, any line of work that you go to. When I was flying cargo, I flew cargo for 13 years. There was a I ran into a couple of guys that didn't belong in the cockpit of an airplane. And to me, it was mind-boggling how they got there. How did they pass the test? Mm -hmm. How did they get there? How could they turn these guys loose in an airplane? And I'm serious. I, that's a one guy in particular. I have never forgot that. I flew with this guy. You, know, you had to take, tape his arms to the seat because this guy would flip switches and he was like spastic, you know. He killed an engine in flight by accident, just flipping switches and buttons and, 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 and just, and so in wrestling, it was basically, you know. So life is like that, you know. You, you, you do, I like to watch people. There's some people that are very interesting to watch. Some people are boring to watch, you know. And some people, uh, it's an inspiration to watch. You know what I mean? You ever seen people like that? Mm -hmm. Like you watch some people and you say, wow, you know, this, this person knows what he's doing. You know, you, you kind of admire the person, you know. And then you watch some other jack off just, what in the world is this person, you know. <laughs> you watch another person, this guy's a loony. I mean, <laughs> everything is happening by accident, you know. It's just, uh, that's my outlook on life, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I know you're an avid uh, hunter now. Is that, that's what you do a lot of your free time? Oh, yeah. yeah I'm, as a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing right now, turkey hunting. Turkey. Turkey season, six weeks of it. Yeah. Not deer hunt, bear hunt, caribou, moose, do a little of everything. Yeah. Where, where do you travel for uh, this, this hunting? Is it all pretty much in the southeast? Or you yeah, turkey hunt, yeah, I hunt a lot in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Got a friend of mine. Hunt in uh, Cherokee National Forest a lot. I hunt in Virginia some, but mainly turkey hunting in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a good guide. No, he's a good hunter and a good friend. You know, and we we have a great time being in out in the in the outdoors. With especially when you got friends doing it with you, that's, that's the best place you want to be. Mm -hmm. Do you still fly fly planes? Yeah, I uh, fly a couple of guys around, three guys around, a uh, couple of days a week, one day a week, two days a week. Yeah, yeah part time job, which is fine. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. You know, and I can leave for a month if I want to. But I don't have to. It's uh, very convenient. You pick the days you work. Yeah. And then sometimes I go for five weeks at a time. I'm gone. Mm -hmm. Got a fifth wheel, my four wheel, four by four pickup truck, and you know I'm happy. Mm -hmm. It's this, that's the life, you know. But everybody's different. Some people say, "Hey, you go hunt for five weeks? Yeah, it, it is very peaceful. It's a very peaceful place to be in the mountains. I've sat there many, many mornings to see the sunrise." And the woods come alive, and you hear the birds, and you never know what you're going to see in the woods. You know, and you think, you do a lot of thinking. And I sat there many times trying to figure, how can I stay here and never go, go back anywhere else? But but here, I never come up with the right answer. I always got to go home. <laughs> got to some pay reason. somebody's bills, right? <laughs> so I always got to go home. You know. <laughs> so, but uh, 
Yeah, it's been my life. In my other life, I must have been an Indian, you know, a real Native American. <laughs> <laughs> Living off the land. Living off the land. Yeah, it's good life. It's clean life. Well, I want to back up a little bit. Uh, we'll start this, not start the interview, but we'll continue the interview in the traditional fashion. Let's give some people some background of how you actually got involved in wrestling, because it went back to your days in Montreal. Yeah, I played hockey. I started, I played hockey when I was probably seven until about 13, 14, you know, and uh, then I, st I started wrestling, I was uh, about 14. I went to this place and uh, I was a wrestling amateur. And uh, then I saw there was, this was a big facility. Then I saw there was a, a wrestling ring where well, we wrestle on the mat, amateur. And then there was a wrestling ring. And I boxed too. I was doing a little bit of everything. I was doing boxing. There was this place had uh, all kinds of coaches: boxing coach, judo, wrestling. You know, the, the place had everything, from weightlifting to. And uh, so I kind of walked over to where the the ring was, and I got to start talking to a couple of the guys, and they said, oh, "You want to wrestle professional?" And I said, "I'd like to try." So I got in the ring and they said, no, 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 this is, you don't, I, I, was, I thought it was like amateur wrestling, you know, take down, you know. <laughs> Just, no, 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 this is different, <laughs> different rules. <laughs> so they taught me how to work, you know. And uh, I did that for, I liked it. And uh, I kept going to the, it was like four days a week. It was, the wrestling was on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I believe. And then the boxing was on uh, Tuesday, it was the odd days, you know, because they couldn't have everything in one night, you know. I kept going to boxing, and then eventually down the road I quit boxing completely. Just got involved with the wrestling. And then they booked the show uh, about six months later in that place. You know, they upstairs, they had a, uh, uh, like a balcony, you know. They had a nice big ring, and they charged people. Actually, it was a, the whole thing was a church. The church was way above. This was in a basement. And the whole place was owned and, opera and run by a priest. Of course, the priest didn't have anything to do with the athletic department. Pat Gerard was, uh, you ever heard of him? I don't know. Pat, his name was Pat Curry. He was a big star in England in the 50s. Because I went into his office and he had pictures all over the wall. Mm -hmm. Even with the queen, Queen Elizabeth, the queen, one of the queens at the time in the 50s. He was a big name, big, big name, and he got deported, I believe, for drugs. Oh, really? Yeah, he got deported back to Canada. He lost everything, and he became religious, like we were talking earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're thinking it's just a matter of time before you find religion here, isn't it? <laughs> I don't it's know. inevitable. I haven't done anything bad that I want to <laughs> repent. I'd do it all over again. <laughs> That's the way I look at life. You know, I would do it all over again. I believe in a good Lord, and, you know, I believe in treating people the way you want to be treated. You know, because I think what goes around comes around. You know, you mistreat people, you're bad, it's going to come back. But, uh, yeah, this guy taught me a lot. Because he, he was, uh, he was, he didn't wrestle anymore. You know, he had to, he retired. When I met him, he was probably... Uh, I don't know, maybe 50 years old. Yeah, uh, but you could tell the guy, he's probably a pretty tough guy, you know. He looked like a wrestler, you know. And uh, he had quite a history. So he was kind of my coach to start, you know. There were, there were a few other people that we probably would have heard of that were, I guess, in the same classes that you were taking, or? The uh, no, not really, not, n nobody that I, uh, Pat Patterson had won there. Earlier. Oh, it was earlier. The, the same place, yeah. Yeah, Pat is three or four years older than me, I think. Was, ter was Terry Garvin there too as well? No, Terry had uh, went there even earlier than that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The place it was it was pretty well known. It, it uh, produced quite a few wrestlers that came out of there. Uh, when I was there, there was, uh, I don't know, 25, 30 local guys there, maybe more than that. But most of them never went anywhere, you know. They're just local guys, and I hit the road. I seventeen. I was in the states, you know. Did you come to the states because that's where the bookings were? Well, it was a way of escaping. I left home when I was fifteen, so you know, I, I didn't get along with my parents. Later, we did. Did great, 
you know, but uh, I was a hard-headed kid, didn't want to go to school, mm-hmm. you know, and today I'd be in trouble. Mm-hmm. But, you know, back in 1962, 61, 60, you know, uh, it was totally different than what it is today, and I hit the road. I went to Boston, because Boston was uh, was a place to learn. So they didn't pay. <laughs> you barely made enough to to make a living. I mean, to make a living. You didn't make a living. You made enough to eat. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. You know. So you'd say you probably learned. I was like uh, a Mexican is today: cheap labor. Right. <laughs> about enough to swim across the river. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to cross the border. What, was it, was it, were the border restrictions pretty uh, lax uh, back yeah, then? Yeah, they called my... Uh, I can't remember. I had a problem one time, and I think I think they called my uncle. I gave the f- a phone number, told him it was my dad, because I had arranged it, you know. Mm-hmm. Told him if I got a problem, just tell him you're my dad. Yeah. And he was living in Boston? No, Montreal. Oh, he was okay. So yeah, once I crossed the border, that's when I went to the state side. Yeah, I, I had. Uh, they were asking me why I was going to the states, but Tony Santos got my working per, uh, permit visa. Of course, I was hostage then. I was an hostage. You know, it's either that or go back home. You know, because he, he wouldn't let me work for anybody else under his papers. You know. So, so, so how long were you stuck in uh, Boston? One year. Yeah, yeah, one year, fifty-five dollars a week, yeah. six, six, seven, eight bucks a matches, ten bucks a matches. What he would do is one night he'd give you twelve, the next night he'd give you seven. He'd average it out six nights a week, fifty-five dollars. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I mean by having my baloney on the window seal, because I didn't, I had a room, I didn't have a refrigerator, so I put my baloney. It was winter time, put the baloney on the window seal, and bread and. The, Sometimes I could afford the uh, the uh, mustard. I make sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. I have barely enough to eat, but I never went hungry. You know, and that's the main thing. It was an experience, and I remember when I I first went there in the Bull Montana Bull Curry. People don't realize that the, you know back in those days, wrestlers looked like wrestlers. Today, people think that wrestlers look like wrestlers. No, they're bodybuilders. They don't look like wrestlers today. That's people's, they perceive wrestlers to, to look that way. Mm-hmm. But they were so, the old timers were so much more impressive than these guys today, I think. I'm not, I'm not demeaning anybody. I'm not, I don't, you know, don't want to, I'm not insulting anyone. I'm just saying, I'll give you an example. If you were, say, at the Boston Garden, or the Montreal Forum, or, and you walked into a dressing room, and you had, uh, in one dressing room, you had Hans Schmidt. You ever heard of him? Mm-hmm. Uh, Kowalski. Uh, Don Leo Jonathan. Uh, these guys were six foot six. No steroids. They look good. They have bodies, you know, but they had natural, you know, big guys. And they all look different. You know, you put Kowalski over here and you look at Jonathan, Don Leo Jonathan, I mean, they were, but they look different. Then you had Yukon Eric, ever heard of? Mm-hmm. Uh, then Bull Curry, Bull Montana, the Bulls. These guys look like mafia. Bull Curry had a bushy eyebrows. I mean, he could scare, uh, the first time I saw him, I was, I was, I was not scared, but I was uh, very intimidated, mm-hmm. you know. And you had uh, Carpentier, Edouard Carpentier. And then you had Yvonne Robert. And I remember seeing all those guys. And none of them look alike. Today it's like they come from the same mold. Mm-hmm. You know, basically. And I don't mean that as, you know, in a bad way. But that's the way the way the people perceive wrestling today. They all got great bodies. You know. Uh, but they all basically look from the same mold. You know. That's the way. I, that's the way I, I see it. Where in the old days, there was all different molds. They all had different identities, different uh, interview style, different, uh, you know. And it was unbelievable. It was, uh, it, and that's to me, the way wrestlers. They look like wrestlers. They look tough because they have big knobs, big cauliflower ears, 
you know, and like that's the first time I've seen uh, Valentine, uh, not Greg, but uh, Johnny, Johnny Valentine in Montreal. He was kind of lean, tall, blonde-headed guy, you know. But my God, man, he used to hit the guys. And geez, <laughs> today, I think they'd walk out. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it would fly today, you know, the way he would whack the guys, you know. And uh, Aunt Schmidt would would kick Edward Carpenter, and he three. 30 minutes later, he'd come back in the dressing room and you could see shoelaces prints all over the chest. <laughs> shoelaces print. <laughs> you don't see that anymore. You know? Mm -hmm. it's totally different. Mm -hmm. Totally. But it's the, the, the world changes. Mm -hmm. And that's where Vince, to me, saw something that no other promoters saw. The marketing of the talent. The marketing, marketing, marketing. Because it was there all along. Yeah. Promoters used to tape and then tape over the tape to save so they didn't want to buy an extra tape. They're killing themselves for that now. <laughs> the yes. All the libraries that Vince McMahon buys up from these promoters that didn't do that? Yeah. They used to tape over mm -hmm. because they thought it was just worthless, worthless unimportant. Uh, and, but the world was different too. I don't know if there was a market then for that either. Oh no, not then. I don't think there was a market. People, today people are in a mode of, uh, but first of all to me, to me the greatest power of all this is television. Television is, I used, like some of these guys I travel with and everything, oh I'm a star, you know, some guys thought they were stars. I never consider myself a star. I don't believe in stars. I don't believe in Hollywood stars. I don't believe in, 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 in there's no such a thing as a star. You know, the only real star is in, it's in the sky, you know. That's a star. But if there's a star on the planet here, it's the television, it's the big screen, you know. Because these people wouldn't be nothing without that screen. Mm -hmm. You know, they could be the same actor, the same talented human being, the same person that, they, but if they haven't been on the screen, they're nobodies. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden they're on the screen, they're stars. So to me the star is the screen. It's like television is the star. Mm -hmm. You could be like, this guy got on the wall there, He's a great athlete, tough guy, Olympian, wrestled in the Olympics. But if he would have never been on television, he would be a nobody. But being on television, he becomes big and people fall I, I don't know there's not a human being I would deplace myself to go see including the Pope because not for disrespect I don't mean to disrespect anybody when I say that simple reason he puts his pants one leg at a time like I do you know and when he wakes up in the morning he's got bad breath like most people do you know and if he doesn't shower he's gonna have B.O. you know and if he doesn't change clothes you know he's gonna smell pretty bad it's just like his movie stars, these beautiful broads on TV. You know, gorgeous. They paint, brush them, you know, make them look, you know, perfect. I guarantee when they get up in the morning, man, they're just like us. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. You know, they're all humans. We're all humans. You know, and people elevate people like, you know. And I, I, I've had people used to come to me and they look at me like, and I used to say, calm down. You know, I'm just, just a guy. You know, I'm just an average guy. You know. <laughs> because I happen to be on television, you know, it doesn't make me any different than anybody else. But you probably were around a lot of people who it did change. Oh, some people who went totally to their heads. Totally, totally, totally to their heads. You know, and I'm going, this, this, these people are in La La Land. You know, just come back on Earth, man. This is reality. You know, it's just, it's just a big belief. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and people elevate people. And I, and I still, to this day, it's hard for me to to understand elevating somebody like that. You may admire, you know, there's a lot of people I admire in the world, you know. I admire Vince McMahon. He's, to me, the guy is probably the guy I admire the most. He's like another uh, guy, the guy, the guy that Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates. You know, started from nothing. You know, his dad would be proud of him today. You know, but I think, you know. But when you got somebody that, 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 that have a vision and, and, and cash in on it and, and, and do, do what he's done, a lot of people hated him for what he did to wrestling. 
But he didn't do anything to wrestling. Even though some people think he hurt wrestling, I don't know, you might have heard that. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, he killed wrestling. He did this to wrestling. He did that to No, wrestling did that to itself. Because uh, I remember wrestling. I'll give you an example. Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling. That's just an example. I, they've done that everywhere. It's, I'm not picking on one place, but... And... Oh, they want good, solid, solid wrestling, right? Good, solid wrestling. And then they put guys in the ring like the Monkey Boys. You're trying to help wrestling? Wait a minute. Where are you going with this? You get two guys that don't even... I, I'm not degrading them. Those guys were real nice kids. Real nice kids. They, they were trying. They, were, they would have loved to have bodies and, and, uh, and you know, uh, been able to make a lot of money in wrestling. But I didn't think they belonged there. Not if you want to protect the business. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, you had the McGuire twins in a ring. A a any other sports? Do you see that in any other sports? No, because they're legitimate. You know? If it was legitimate wrestling, the, the McGuire twins would have never been in a ring. <laughs> they would have got killed. They would have got destroyed. You know what I mean? So in a way, they're trying to make people believe. And then by, by their actions, they were killing it. And now they blame Vince McMahon for doing this, the same thing to the wrestler. Well, Vince did it his way. He told people he didn't care. It was entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it is entertainment. It's always been entertainment. You know, the only time it never was entertainment, it may be when it first started, well, they didn't do much. They hang on to a hold for an hour, maybe in, in the early 1900, you know, during the time of Schmidt and all those guys, you know. Well, but the matches were boring. They went in the ring, you know, and they just hang on to a hold and they try to make the guy give up. And, you know, and, and half of it was a shoot. You know, half of it was, you know, back then it was, but uh, it's always been a work. Yeah. When, uh, I love asking this question of guys who started wrestling before it got, you know, I, I usually pinpoint the mid-80s as the point where most of the fans believed it was real to where most of them believed wrestling was not real. Would you have, starting out, you, when you did, if you, if I would have told you then that we're gonna, the wrestling's going to be so exposed and most people are going to think it's fake, would you have thought that uh, it would have survived? No, because we were all the, it was, it was, uh, it was ingrained into you that you had to protect the business. I didn't even smart up my first wife. I was married to her for 15 years. We never talked wrestling. This is true. I tell people that. We never discuss wrestling. And uh, finally, uh, this other guy's wife, one day I come home, she was mad at me a little bit. She said, you never told me about this. Never told me about that. And I went, well, tell me about what? And so this other guy's wife finally told her, you know, about the business. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, you know, but that was 15 years later. And it was a different generation. People didn't give a shit, you know. The guy told his wife everything like, a, I don't know. I never discussed my business with my wife. You know, I come home with a Band-Aid on my head, you know, and uh, that was it, you know. Did you get hurt? Yeah, I just got a little banged up. It was no big deal, you know. What about my business? And sometimes I had a bad knee, a bum knee, an elbow, or, you know. It was part of my business. Mm -hmm. So it was ingrained in us. You never talk business unless you talk to a wrestler. Never, 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 never discussed it. Well, my brother, I never have. Never discussed it. My family, my father, my mother, never, never, never discussed the business. It was just a no-no, mm -hmm. you know. And the promoters used to say, well, yeah, you're going to kill the business. Because, well, they did in England. I don't know if you remember, six, late 60s, I believe, there was a big expose. You know, I think it was in the 60s. Big expose in England. And it killed it for a while you know the business just went you know because uh, uh, well people back then wanted to believe so you kept the image as much as you could that it was you know and a lot of guys used to get really get mad pissed off you know somebody would say hey wrestling is fake you know I just used to ignore them or you know I'd say well you ought to try it you know then you really know mm -hmm. you know I never really got mad because uh, I knew what I was doing. 
you know, I knew what I was doing. I mean, it's who you try to kid. But I, I tried to protect it because it was, it was part of your education. You protect the business. There was promoters. You weren't allowed to bring your girlfriend or your wife to the matches. Yeah, that, because it, it kept the girls away from the matches, especially if you were a baby face. You know, you were a good-looking kid. You know, you, you know, they wanted to attract girls to come to the wrestling. So if the wife or your girlfriend was there, that was no good. And another reason, too, is a lot of times they have problems with the wives and girlfriends arguing with each other. Well, my husband's better than yours. My husband made more money than yours. My husband's going to be the champion. And, you know, all of a sudden, it'd be the problem. So they didn't want wives and girlfriends in the matches. They ran it as a business more than today's ran as entertainment. You know, people are open about it. And people are still going. And that, to me is mind-boggling it is mind-boggling but but you know why people want to see trash today people don't people don't want to see good good entertainment I don't think I don't already ever watch TV for a simple reason I got 150 channels and I flip through them and I haven't found anything I like because you sit in front of a television and you think you're an idiot what if you know I got an IQ of 25 I'm retarded if I watch this program. Like uh, the survivors. Come on, who are they kidding? I mean, who are they kidding? You know, it's all put on like wrestling. <laughs> and, but to me, the, 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 the show that really opened up everything, and I think Vince saw it, I think, I might be wrong, is the Jerry Springer. Mm -hmm. When the Jerry Springer garbage start to sell, and I don't mean that as an insult to Jerry Springer. Hey, I, I, I admire people who are successful. If you're selling garbage or you're selling good stuff. But that's when Vance's business start changing. Up yours and starting to give the, you know, the, you know Mr. Ass. And you know, now he's putting his pants down, I heard. You know, kiss my ass and, and the beer and the tips and, and all the. Why? Jerry Springer is getting great ratings. So Vance, Vance will follow the trend. Mm -hmm. The old, the old time promoters didn't do that. That's why they're all gone. They didn't do that. You got to change with the world. You know, if you want, well, you know that yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to change. If you don't, you're going to be left behind. And that's what happened. That's why he's all by himself. That's why he's all by himself. And uh, uh, because what he's today, that stuff sells. Don't sell to me. You know, because I, you know, I refuse to get on that level. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, now you watch movies today. There's not talent. There's no talent. I, I'm sorry. That's my opinion. Okay, and I don't mean it as disrespect to anybody. If you got a chance selling garbage and make a fortune, you go right ahead. Vince is a billionaire. I respect that. You know, if I would have thought of it, I probably would have done it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure I would have done it. You know, but you got to look at the work behind it, the effort. Yeah, he probably never sleeps. Works, 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 works. Yeah, it's a lot of work. You know, he earned it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and then you had Ted Turner that took over the WCW. It was an NWA then, and it's gone. Why? Because they didn't change. They try. They try to copy. But you know, you can't compete with a genius. Mm -hmm. There was no genius in Atlanta. You know, they were all a bunch of dumbasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were from the old school. And the old school is gone. You know, it's just like if we try to bring things from the 30s. It's gone. You know, all that stuff is gone. It's uh, what's going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It's going to change. And if Vance is around, Vance will change with it. And if all these other promoters, uh, Vern and uh, all those guys would have changed. But no, they were ingrained in the old things like I was. You know, because I always believe in the old way. You know, but it's not the right way. See, and if wrestling would have been like that when I started, I would have never been a wrestler. Never. Never. The simple reason, I can't sing, I can't dance, and I can't rock and roll. I can't. And, I, and I'm serious as heck. What they do, I can't do. Yeah, it's, I just, it's, it's that simple. If wrestling would have been like that, what they do today, I can't. I, I could have never done even in my prime. You know. I would, I would have been uh, totally in a business that I wouldn't have known what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. 
You know, in the old days, you depended on wrestling. You win, we wrestle for one hour. You went in the ring, you fought like a pit bull. You know, that was my style. You know, go out there and just fight and wrestle and, you know, and, and, and just, and people believed it. You know, people believed it because you made them believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And today, they don't believe in the wrestling, but they still go. I guess they go because it's, they consider a good show, I guess. I guess that, that's the way I would put it. Or maybe because they got some girls with bodies. They got a combination of everything to attract people. They got all these broads with these bodies. Well, you know, in the old days, you had some of these broads that, you know, some of them were good looking, some weren't so, but they were tough. And actually tough. Mm -hmm. You know, these broads today ain't tough, you know. I mean, I remember Mae Young, she'd knock out a guy in the drop of a hat, you know, in the old days. It's a fact. You had, uh, you know, I remember this gal in, in, in Boston, Alma Mills, you know. Uh, you know, she probably could, could whip the average guys in the street, you know. And then you had, you had some good-looking women in wrestling, you know, and they're pretty, they're pretty tough, too, Moolah, you know, so was, yeah, Penny Banner, you had, yeah, you had a lot of nice, good-looking women, but you had some that weren't uh, so good-looking, but they weren't, I don't think they were selling as much the sex and the, the appeal as they are today, mm -hmm. you know. And usually the good-looking girl was always the baby face, you know. And, uh, but it's different. What was your ticket out of the Boston uh, area? How did? Because you, you moved on down to the, the ticket out in Boston area. I uh, I wrote a letter to uh, Leroy McGurk, and he answered my letter. He got my papers to work for, and I finally I'd saved about twenty five bucks for train ticket. I got on a train. <laughs> I went to to uh, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and you know back then too there was another thing. You went to these territories, they call them territories. You know, there was like 30 different promoters. You had Florida, you had Georgia, you had North Carolina, you had all these different territories. Oklahoma, you had Texas. And you went to these different territories and there was no young kids in the business. I went to Oklahoma and I think Ron Reed, what's his name, uh, Buddy Colt. Mm -hmm. His name was Ron Reed. Then. Buddy Colt had just left, I think. And he was, he's a little bit older than me, by three, four years maybe. He had left, and they were replay. I came in, I guess, to replace him. And uh, all the guys there were Al Lovelock, you remember him? Have you ever heard of Al Lovelock? Uh, uh, Anton de Ripper Leone, uh, all those guys. They were all 45, 50, 48, 42, 40. They were all older, older guys. I was the only kid there. You know, today it's the opposite. You go into a dressing room and it's you got one old fart and then you got all young guys. You know, it's, <laughs> it's totally reverse. You know, uh, where you were the only young guy in the dressing room. So another thing too is you wrestle guys that knew how to wrestle, that knew how to work, you knew what they were doing. So you learn. Today. Who's teaching who? You're learning with a guy that don't have any more experience or got less than you. So he's not learning and you're not learning. You know, I've been to some of these shows, you know, and some are good, but there's some people that's just, 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 just amazing. You know, you can't blame the guy. I mean, he's, you have nobody to teach. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you got to places that you guess, well, I taught him. Well, the guy can't even wrestle himself. And, and then they, they try to do what what's... WWF is, WWE is doing, you know, and it's not done right, you know, they, today they think because they do flips and they go on the top rope and they do all kinds of, you know, it's, uh, to me, it's, it's, I don't understand it, you know, it's, it's, but it's today's wrestling, mm -hmm. okay, uh, you tell a guy to go in the ring and, you know, 30, 40 minutes to, with a hold and then have the people standing, it still can be done. You still can do that. You, know, you, you still can go in a ring and make people believe that you're hurting somebody. I guarantee if I bring back guys, even some that are deceased, if it was possible to bring them back, put them in a ring. What today is people's uh, understanding of wrestling, that they, they still would stand up and holler and scream and just with wrestling. Mm -hmm. 
without doing any of that stuff. You know, if you bring, uh, for example, uh, you ever seen Pat O'Connor, Buddy Rogers match? Mm -hmm. you, you didn't see no punches. Nope. Remember the title match? Chicago, mm -hmm. biggest crowd ever, Comiskey Park. That's one of my favorite tape. Mm -hmm. It was a two out of three. Buddy Rogers beat Pat O'Connor that night. And it was 103,000, I think, the gate. That was 1961, I believe. It was unbelievable business in Comiskey Park. You know, probably what, $5 ringside? I don't even know. But, you know, then you watch the match. Nobody threw a punch. They threw forearms. Everything was legal. People were standing. This is like Briscoe and Funk. Mm -hmm. These guys could go in the ring for one hour. These guys can't go two minutes without kicking or punching. Because they never learn anything else. I, I'm not talking bad against the guys today because if nobody teaches you, you're not going to learn. So you got a guy who's teaching who? Well, one guy, you know, teaches what he knows and uh, it's about like the other guy knows. So they're on the same level. So they're not going to get any better. But in the old days, you step in the ring with a guy who's been in the business 15 years, 20 years. And the guy, the promoter said, oh, we go 20 minutes, well, 20 minutes. You know, and you never did the same thing. You know, you just wrestle. You learn to wrestle because you were wrestling with a guy and you, you know, and it rubbed off, it rubs off on you. You learn. You told me off camera before we started this interview that you started a, uh, a wrestling school at one point. You closed it down after three months. Tell us I just didn't have the patience, and uh, and uh, I I didn't want to rip people off. Mm -hmm. I could have. I could have very simply taken their money. Uh, I thought by starting a school, I had a couple of little ads. I had a building I rented. Actually, I didn't rent it. I was behind the gym that I was working out in Pineville, and the guy uh, let me use it, and I thought I'm out of wrestle and I started getting some guys there and you know they were like a hundred and forty pounds thirty pounds five foot six five foot four thirty five years old the guy's not gonna get any bigger you know I remember one case a guy shows up with his mother she had the money I forgot what it was I think it's five hundred dollars I charged you know and then they have I can't remember the deal, but it's like five hundred dollar deposit she came in, she had the money. And she was hoping for a great career for, for her son. And I, I just had to sit down and tell this lady, and she still didn't understand it. She got kind of mad at me, I think, for not taking the money and taking the kid and teaching him how to wrestle. You know, well, they were expecting to be taught how to wrestle and go somewhere and make money. Mom, you can't tell somebody like that. Yeah, you're gonna go to WWE and <laughs> you're gonna make money, you know. Unless maybe the guy has one leg, you know. <laughs> but that was just a passing thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Vince is, can use people. That, but this guy just didn't have, and there was quite a few like that. And they kept showing up and showing up and finding, and the guys didn't want to do this, didn't want to do that. I used to tell them, you know, you, you, you go in the ring five minutes and you're out of breath. When you come in here in the morning, why don't you warm up? Why don't you do uh, 50, 100 squats? You know, do 25, 30, 40 push-ups, 50 push-ups. That's not asking much. We used to do hundreds of push-ups. You know, and uh, get in condition. You know, that's that's number one. That's one thing. I always. Uh, that's that's why you, a lot of guys that made money in wrestling were very well conditioned. Because we had to go an hour. I remember wrestling fair flare one hour in the afternoon, then we'd go at night wrestle another hour in another town somewhere. Two hours. And sometimes we'd ask for an extra 15 minutes. These guys couldn't last 15. You know a lot of guys that could do an hour? Non-stop. My longest match was two hours and 40 minutes. Yeah. In 1965 or 6, in North Bay, Ontario, Canada. I wrestled a hangman in a, in a no time limit uh, Texas death match. We wrestled two hours and 40 minutes. Got in the ring at uh, 10 o'clock and we got out of the ring. It was uh, after 12.30. So almost one, a quarter to one. People were coming to the matches by 11.30 because they were on the news giving the results of the matches. It was a local, in a small town, about 60, 70,000 people. They were giving the results at 11, 11.30 news. And they said, well, we can't give you the result in the main event because uh, they're still in the ring wrestling. So all the neighborhood would come to the matches. Of course, the doors were open. Mm -hmm. They weren't selling no more tickets. You know. So people started coming in. We wrestled to a quarter to one. 
So a lot of the uh, early memories people have of you is, is teaming up with Terry Garvin. Who uh, that was at the beginning. It's, I we didn't wrestle very much together. The first five years, maybe six years. Whose idea was it to team you guys up and as brothers? I think we went to Louis. I can't remember. We teamed up in. Uh, I think it was uh, Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, I believe. Mobile, Alabama. And then we went to North Bay, Ontario. It was a summer, just a summer place. We wrestled in the wintertime. We go to, we we'll go to the south. We go to Florida. Go back to Canada in the summer. And uh, then we came to, came here. I think first time in '68. But well, we went to Florida quite a bit in the winter time. It was perfect, you know. And then, because up in Canada we couldn't wrestle in the winter time up, up there because the ice hockey arena they were taken for hockey. So you wrestle in Canada from uh, probably May till uh, the last week of September, middle of October. Then we head south. We did that for like five years. You know. I read in some other interviews that you guys weren't even that close. I mean, it was just kind of a business no, well, tag team. We 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 we're to totally different, you know. Terry had his own lifestyle, and I had my own lifestyle. And uh, Terry was not an outdoor person. I was always fishing and hunting, and, and uh, you know it was business. We traveled the roads together, you know. And uh, we come back to town. He went his way, I went my way, and you know it's. And then uh, I think the last time we teamed up was in the seventies. We split up for a while. Uh, I remembered Mr. Crockett Sr. I think it was in 68. Mr. Crockett took me aside one time and he said, uh, if you ever go on your own a single as a single in wrestling, call me. He liked me. He liked the way I wrestle, I guess. He was a very nice fellow. Very honest, very nice. And in 70, I want to say 72, I gave him a call, and he brought me in. Whichever, it was the year the Thunderbolt Patterson came to Charlotte. So I came in, and Mr. Crockett says, uh, I'll make you some money the best. Oh, if, if he would have lived another 15, 20 years, yeah, my career would have been different. Probably even better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He really, uh, he really liked the way I wrestled, because he told me many times. He says, you're going to go along. I was a kid. I was just, you know, 1972, was I 27 years old? Yeah. Yeah, 65, yeah, 27 years old. And uh, what was I going to say? Uh, he, uh, he brought me in, and then Thunderbolt Patterson came into the Charlotte area, and the place went crazy. I don't know if you ever read about that stuff, I ever heard of it. Thunderbolt mm -hmm. set the place on fire. It was sold out everywhere. There's no kidding. I mean, he was, he'd shake his booty and do that, you know, uh, I mean, this guy was in his great interview, you know, Thunderbolt was, I love him to death, and I, so he, he teamed me up with him, but he, what, the way he did it, he split us, yeah, but three nights a week with Thunderbolt, and then the other three nights was Briscoe, Jerry, mm -hmm. Jerry was here, and Jerry was not happy, I guess, with the money he was making, so, the old man, Mr. Uh, Crockett, was trying to, you know, keep us happy, you know. Because if you were with Thunderbolt, you made money. It was sold out everywhere. Yeah. I remember going to towns and we beat the Andersons, two straight falls. Come back following week against them again. Sold out. Yeah. Hmm. Beat them two straight. So unheard of. So Thunderbolt Patterson for a while was the what the most people think of the Hulk Hogan was to the north. Oh, in this area, this area was was just unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, I'm talking about 72, 72, 73, and then Mr. Crockett died, and then uh, then I got shafted out of my because uh, the Bookers changed. You know. So the Booker took my place. I got. Put to the side. I left anyway. This Who became close. Booker at that time? You said when you got shafted. There was uh, Johnny Weaver and and Rip Hawk became the Bookers. Well, Johnny Weaver saw the money, mm -hmm. so he put him. He put himself in a six-man tag. 
him and Briscoe and Dunnable, I got left out. Mm -hmm. He gave me his partner. It was a Hart Nelson at the time. Yeah. So I saw the writing on the wall, you know. I left. Yeah. That's one thing. I, I wasn't happy. I didn't do a lot of bitching. I didn't complain. A lot of guys used to bitch, complain, you know, in the cars and the dress room and everything, you know. And what, what does the wrestlers can do? They can't do nothing. You got bitching, go bitch to, to the guy that pays you. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't like it, leave. Uh, like I said, it was 30 different promotions. It didn't bother me to pack up and leave, you know. Even though I was married, had kids in school, it didn't bother me. It's pack up and go, you know. It's not that hard. And uh, that's the way I live my life, you know. Was... And after you left Crockett, who did you work for immediately after Crockett? Well, it turned out good. I went to, uh, that's when I teamed up with Terry. Terry was in, uh, Terry was in Memphis with Jimmy. And uh, they, were, they were doing the thing. I think they already had started doing the thing with the pink mat. Terry had the curls, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was, Bobby Pins, he was throwing, like a, like gorgeous George had done, you know. And Terry was perfect for that, you know, with that big nose, you know, and, and he'd do that walk, you know, that, that, that gay walk, you know, and I mean, it was, uh, he, he was perfect for it. So he was doing that, and uh, as, a, as a partner, he had, uh, Duke Myers was his partner. And when I, uh, I decided to leave here, I don't know how him and I got, got together, he heard of it or something. You know, I knew travel in the business. You know. uh, one of us called it the other, and he says, hey, come on in. He says, well, I didn't want to work for Nick Goulas. Nick Goulas had a bad reputation. Nick Goulas was, you know, to me was, <laughs> was garbage as a promoter. As a human, I don't know. And I never talked to him outside of wrestling, so. But as a promoter, I thought he was a, he was a joke. He was a clown. And he, you couldn't tell it. You couldn't believe a word he said. And I had heard bad things about him my whole career. Now, this is 1972. So 10 years. I've been in the business 10 years. And I'd swear that I always bypassed Nashville. You know, nothing against Nashville because Nick Goulas lived there. But I was going to never work there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think he called me. Or somebody from the office called me. So anyway, I got to talk to him. Oh, boy, he says, don't believe everything you hear, blah, blah. I'll make you a lot of money. And, you know, well, money... That was the first thing he always said. You're going to make a lot of money. You know, well, people are attracted by that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I told him, I said, now, let me tell you, the first time you don't do what you tell me, I'm gone. I'm out of here. You know, that's simple. You know, no notice, I'm gone. <laughs> and I don't mind leaving. You know, some people find it hard to pack up and move. Not me. And wherever I hang my hat, I'm home. That's, that's my philosophy in life. So... <laughs> I go to Tennessee. I said, well, I'll give it a chance. He made me all kinds of promises. Talked to Terry. Terry said, yeah, I'd make a lot of money here. In Memphis, they were selling out Memphis. Jerry Jarrett was the booker. And Jerry was a good booker. Well, I get to uh, Nashville the very first day. And I go to the office. <laughs> and I walk in. And uh, I was booked in Birmingham on Monday. Memphis was Monday too, but they didn't want me to go to Memphis. Terry was there. They were going to ease uh, Duke Myers out, and I was going to slide in, you know, as the third partner. Well, his partner and Jimmy was the manager. So I'm going to go to Birmingham for the first few weeks. I get in the office, and Mrs. Christine Jarrett gives me a bag, a brown bag. And she says, Mr. Goulas said you have to wear this tonight in Birmingham. And I open the bag, <laughs> and there's a white mask and a white outfit. They want me to be a medic. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, with all due respect, I said, you tell Dick Goulas he can wear this. He can be the medic. I'm out of here. I was going to be partners with Don Duffy. Mm -hmm. Don Duffy was a medic. So they wanted a team. So I threw the bag, or give it to her, whatever, I can't remember, and walked out. And I was almost across the street in my car when Danny Dusek, which was working in the office at the time, came running out. Oh, no, 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 don't, you don't have to. He says, you don't have to wear that tonight. You don't have to wear that. I said, fine. But I says, you've already tried. 
already tried the first time. I hadn't been in the office two minutes. Here I am, I'm gonna wear a mask. Just said, nah, I ain't wearing no mask, you know? So, you see, because if you do it, you're done. Yep, there yeah. Go. yeah, so, so that's how it uh, started in, in uh, Nashville, and then uh, eventually, I don't know all the details, but a couple of weeks, three weeks later, I teamed up with Terry. I think they hurt Duke Myers or, or did something where I came in and replaced as is. So they had a brother team. And we worked against, oh, they sold, we sold out every Monday, every Monday. Every single Monday, Memphis was sold out. It was in 1973. I remember that we, uh, I, I guess I went into 73, the middle of 73, or beginning of 73, I can't remember exactly. But it was, uh, and <laughs> I remember, <laughs> we worked with uh, uh, Fargo. Mm -hmm. Jackie Fargo was big name in Memphis. Jerry Jarrett was the, was the booker. And he had some of the craziest idea, but it worked, because he was selling out. You, know, you can't knock success, you know, I don't care. If it sounds the most ridiculous or stupid idea you ever had, but if you know, you're going to sell out, they're selling tickets. And uh, <laughs> I remember an incident where they brought Rough House Fargo, Sonny Fargo. Rough House Fargo was supposedly a nut out of the nut, nut house. They would release him once a month I and mean, once a year. It was Jackie's brother, and Jackie would take him around, you know, for a week or two in the summer. What it was, it was his vacation time. He had a job here in North Carolina, and his vacation was two weeks. They bring him to Memphis. Said he got released from the mental institution for a couple of weeks in the care of his brother. Well, we didn't know anything about this. They had been doing this for quite some time, and the fans knew Rough House Fargo. Rough House was a new loony out of the nut house. Well, Terry and I, we didn't know. You know, we just had started working there. So Jared says, we're going to work a deal where we hurt Jackie Fargo's partner, which I think was Tojo, I think. Anyway, we hurt his partner, so he's going to bring his brother Rough House. So we sign a contract, we're going to wrestle Rough House. And without knowing that this guy is a lunatic from the nut house, right? And then after we sign a contract, they tell us. So we said, we don't care. Looney or not, man, we'll wrestle the guy. And Rough House, you know, he's not a big guy, you know. Weighed on, what, 170 pounds maybe? Mm -hmm. You know. Place was sold out. Sold out. Memphis was sold out. And we're in the dressing room. And Jerry Jarrett tells us what we're going to do. <laughs> the deal is we go out in the ring. Somehow the match started. The bell rang. But Rough House was still in the dressing room. Terry had still his robe on. You know, he had his robe, you know. He looked like a real douchebag, I swear. Just, you know, I call him douchebag. It's just, look at the guy, Zazu Pitts. Remember the old Zazu Pitts in the movies? <laughs> He's in the ring with these big curls, <laughs> strutting around. <laughs> and the bell rang. Just to make it official, the, the, the match had started. And Roughhouse comes running to the ring. He jumps on the apron of the ring, leaps into the ring, and goes, Aah! just a screaming and scratching his head and just waving his hand. And Terry faints. Goes in spiral, you know, just with his robe on. Just like you see in a movie, a woman fainting, you know. So he tells us that in the dressing room, and I said, and that's the end of the match. There's no match. And I said, uh, this is a joke. I, I thought it was a joke till it happened. Because, you know, you gotta, you gotta give a match to these people. You gotta do something. I sent them home without a match. I said, they're gonna kill the place. You know, there won't be nobody here next week. Because uh, it was a good payoff. The place was jam packed. Until we went into the ring, I still thought that Terry, Jimmy, and all the other guys were in on the joke. You know, and they were ribbing me. You know, something else was going to happen. And we went into the ring, and that's exactly what happened. Terry fainted, and we lost the match. On a faint. 
And I said, my God, there goes our payoff. The check's going to be about 10 cents next week. <laughs> and sold out again. Wow. We had a return. He stretched it one week, mm -hmm. you know, just to stretch it, get more out of it. Mm -hmm. People really wanted to see that. And we had a pink mat. Terry would insist on a pink mat. They put a mat just for us, you know, and Jimmy would spray it, you know, pink mat. Did and I, the pink mat did it. I mean, the pink mat would really get people pissed off. Did, uh, did the other boys know about uh, Terry's, you know, lifestyle? Oh, yeah. Terry was wide open. He yeah. didn't give a shit. So back then, it, w it wasn't a big deal to, to people? No. People. No. No. He, he, nobody gave a shit. I mean, excuse the word, but I mean, nobody cared. You know, he had his own life. He didn't bother the guys. You know, he didn't bother the guys. It was, he had his own lifestyle. It was like a guy that he likes women. You know, he, if there was re women wrestlers, in it, he didn't bother them. Mm -hmm. You know, he just go to bars wherever he went, you know. And, no, it, it was it was like there was quite a few guys that were gay in the business, you know, and mo most most all the boys, they were open with it. They know used to. Do they rib him more because of it, or no? He used to rib the guys. He used more. to rib the guys. More. Oh, Terry was a big ribber. Oh, he never stopped. Oh, never, 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 never stopped. He was ribbing all the time, you know. And but the guys didn't. The guys didn't care. He never bothered them, you know. As far as Sex, you know, I mean, it's, he was not interested. You know, another thing, too, this misconception about gay people. I, I've known a lot of gay people, and I, I don't care about their lifestyle. I don't, it's not my lifestyle, but who cares? You know, uh, but they're not after a guy my age or your age, a 40 year old guy. They're after younger guys. They're just like guys. They're all the young broads. You know, they want young, young women, you know. That's, that's, that's what I understood, you know. He, he never looked for an old guy. You know, he was always looking for a guy that was 19, 20, you know, 18, 19, you know. Yeah. But uh, but some, some I know a couple of guys, they, they had their own lifestyle. They had their own, I don't know who was the wife, but they had, a, you know, they lived as a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you get that in any business, you know. And usually that was kept it, they kept it to themselves. You know, you didn't talk about it. You know, you know some, but... What am I going to talk about? Hey, did you have a good time with your boyfriend last night? <laughs> yeah. Just doesn't come up. No. No, but he would make jokes, you know. Like he'd walk into a restaurant, you know, and walk, you know, and just, you know, I'd just laugh. Man. It's just, everybody would look at him. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Another area that you had a lot of success with was in Georgia. Mm hmm yeah, Georgia. Oh, you had, you had good talent there, you know. Very good talent, and, and I had chemistry with about three or four of the guys, you know, me and Jake the Snake, you know, I made money there, uh, Ole was the promoter, you know, and Ole's, you know, I wish there would have been more promoters like him, you know, more of them. You always had a lot of success with when Ole was a booker in the area, <sighs> you liked your style. You know, the yeah, yeah, well I wrestled with Ole against him and partners with him, Right. I was partners with him in Florida. And all he liked that rough, you know, rough stuff, you know, and go out there and you want something to earn it, you know. In the old day, you know, we went out there, we didn't, it was not a shoot, but you want my arm, you're going to work for it. You know, I'm not going to give you my arm, you know. <laughs> so you, have to, you have to fight. And people see that. People see that. That's the problem today. These guys want to be, I've had guys come to me and they say, hey, brother, they barely squeeze your finger. I would argue, you know, jeez, are you a man? Yeah, why is that brother, you know? Yeah. Give me a handshake like a man. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the way I was brought up, you know? Not this two fingers, you know, and all this. Well, they wrestle like that, and it shows. You know, how many times I've seen the wrestling matches, the guy got a headlock, and my God, I could put two arms between. You know, there's, 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 there's plenty of space there. You're not hurting nobody, you know? crank on it, you know, just squeeze. I mean, that's how in the old days guys got, you know, cauliflower ears, you know, from elbows and headlocks and because they were tight. You know, you didn't see no air in between. You know, <laughs> today, <laughs> you know, you see a lot of that, you know, and uh, there's no pain, no gain. That's the way the business it was in the old days, you know. 
a little bit of pain, man. I mean, not where you couldn't work the next night, but you come back, your chest was red, you had marks, you know, you had, you know, you knew you'd been in a fight. Mm -hmm. That was a work, but you, you knew you'd been in a scrap, you know. The, uh, and people can tell that. People sit there, especially people sit at ringside, they watch that. You know, they see the guy that puts the most effort. And the guy that goes out there and is barely like dancing. He locks up, you know, he's loose, you know, and there's no effort. When you put an effort, your muscles tense up. You can see muscles in your legs and your back and your arms, right? If you just go out there and you relax, there is no effort. It's the same thing as getting on a stage and, 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 and you just sing. Or you go out there, and, 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 like a Tina Turner. You know, she was my favorite. I love that woman. You know, what a dancer. I mean, what a singer, a performer. You, you see her sweating. You ever see her work? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Elvis was the same thing. You know, like some of these entertainers, the effort and the energy they put behind all that. Well, wrestling the same way. Same way. Yeah. And I guarantee Tina Turner, if she wouldn't have been, you know, that, 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 that uh, energetic, her success would have been half. Mm -hmm. Her success would have been half, I, I think, you know, because it added to it. She had great talent, great legs. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. I still dream about her. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> She's still got great legs, even at her age. Oh, now. yes, yes, yes. I've seen her not long ago oh, yeah? on TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was uh, wrestling in Georgia being had national television different than any other place she'd been at up to that point? Uh, well, there was on a cable. It was a novelty. And, well, we were going places with the word. That's when you started to get exposed. You know, well, before, if you didn't leave Florida, well, the only ones that knew about, about you was the magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you weren't known all over the country. You know, so you could wrestle five years in Florida and have another career somewhere else another five years. You were brand new. You know, you had exposure through the magazine, but it was not much. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, what Georgia did is the cable, it really started exposing you all across, all over. And of course, not everybody had the cable, you know. But uh, you started being known all over, all over the United States. And they had, the, at one time, they had what great ratings they had. Georgia Championship Wrestling, as a matter of fact, I think they had three hours mm -hmm. because of the ratings. They started with one hour and the ratings were so good that they wanted three hours of it. As a matter of fact, I read somewhere or, or heard some, that uh, is is what made Ted Turner or helped make make him was the ratings on Georgia Championship Wrestling that was when he first started. That's how hot the the, the, the thing was. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your match with the Road Warriors coming in? We had talked about before bringing in some of these muscle guys, and you had to work with them to compensate for their lack of ability. You remember wrestling them in Georgia? Oh yeah, yeah. Me and Jerry Olds beat them in Columbus the title mm -hmm. but it was hard it was hard but uh, it was worth the effort well I, we had to do a lot of work it, you know they weren't they were green they were they didn't know what to, they were strong guys and dangerous you know I mean big guys you know so you have to be careful you know because they can do stuff and hurt you without even trying mm -hmm. and so we had to work around you know around the stuff but they were good guys good guys uh, hawk and, and animal you know they were they were good guys it was they wanted to learn you know and you know of course if they didn't like you it was a different story you know but i think they respected me and jerry and a lot of the other guys you know but uh, yeah when Oli brought them in my god and I, well, I was booked with them <laughs> it was survival <laughs> Yes, but you know, if they hurt you, they didn't. They didn't. They didn't do it on purpose. Right. Yeah, they were so big, and uh, you know, they couldn't wrestle, but they could fight. You know, they they you know, they were they were tough guys. You know. So there wasn't any animosity about bringing guys that were so inexperienced into your area. No, there would have been animosity if they would have been six hundred pounds apiece. Yeah. And fat. Yeah, they would have been. You know, a lot of guys resented that. You know, what is this piece of garbage doing here? You know, Lutez hated that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, because he was a real wrestling. You know, he hated stuff like that. Yeah. Because how can you respect somebody like that? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, not athletic. Yeah, non athletic. You know, I, I, that's what I never really liked about the business. Was some guys maybe as as a person they were good guys, but 
you couldn't respect him. It's, it's, you know, what are you doing in this business? You know, uh, get yourself in shape. Even though it's not everybody that can have a body, at least get in shape. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then you get respect. You know, I started in this business, you know, and it didn't take me long to realize, you know, I was handicapped. I mean, very much handicapped. I didn't speak English. I came to the States, man, I ate hot dogs and hamburgers for six months, you know. I didn't speak a word of English. Well, ten words that I knew, they were all bad. I couldn't use them. I got slapped if I used them. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> you know, the first thing you learn when you learn a language is your, your friends teach you bad words. Right. Oh, yeah. And I know that because I went into a restaurant one time and the guy says, repeat, blah, blah, blah. So I told that to the waitress and her eyes got this big and I, I knew I said the wrong thing. You know, so after that, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to repeat anything. So when you started wrestling in Boston, you didn't speak any English. No, at that point. didn't speak English. Wow. How many years? And, did uh, it take? and all my sisters are English. Yeah. All my ancestors are English, English, Scottish, Irish, and but we were. I was raised in Quebec. Right. I was born in Montreal, raised 600 miles, in a in a place called Cap de Rosier, and it's it's just it's totally French. For, you know, most of the people who watch this are going to be American, so they and they don't understand the geography of Canada. Montreal and Quebec aren't that far apart. Montreal, you got uh, you can get along real good in English. When you start going into the north and Quebec, northeast Quebec, and uh, you know, there's hardly any English. Right. You know. And uh, so my dad didn't speak English. My mom didn't speak English. The last one in my family could speak English was my grandmother. You know. And they had dropped it over generations. Mm-hmm. They came and moved to Gaspe, you know, uh, 600 miles from Montreal. There was no, uh, in people, so they just spoke French. Mm-hmm. You think they would have kept speaking English at home, you know, and keep it handed it down. It's good to know two languages. But I had to learn English. So that was a handicap when it came to, to interviews, you know, which is a big part of wrestling, you know. A lot of guys made nothing but money with their with their mouth. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't wrestle a lick. They wrestled with their mouth. You know, made people believe they was going to kill Godzilla and King Kong, and you know, and uh, you know. The, and uh, the other th- thing I had is uh, I'm short. I was small. You, know? you got guys that start at six foot four and 280 pounds and can talk. He's he's got a hell of a start. He probably can go through a, make a fortune without even never learning how to wrestle. He's got it. He's got the body. He's got the, the, the size. The, the tall. He can talk. The rest is, uh, if he learns that, then it'll be even better. So, the way to make it up was to stay in shape. And I worked out with a lot of guys in you ought to wrestle. You know, not that I'm a tough guy. I I can take care of myself. I never back down from a fight. And uh, you know, if, if I had to, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, but by by being able to go in the ring and wrestle. You know, and, and, and even with some of the some of the big guys, you know, and just just go in there, and you gotta make yourself look good. You know, if people don't believe you can beat anybody, you're not gonna draw anything. You were you were around, I think, Georgia Championship Wrestling when when Vince bought the time slot. Do you remember any specifics about that? Time? Yeah, I uh, think it's when I left. I think it's when I left. Uh, that's the summer in '85. I think I went to Canada. I think I was gone. I went to Canada that summer of '85, and I had I had a big grudge. We, had, J- Jimmy and I, had a big grudge with the Rougeau brothers. Oh, we made oh, what a summer! Probably the best summer I've had in in my whole entire life. Yep. So even uh, though it was a short period, it, the pay was really good up in Canada in the summer. Oh, we sold out everywhere we went. Everywhere, it was unbelievable. There's just and everything was by accident. It was totally an accident. And it's funny how life works. I was in the States, I was gone all my life. And my mother had, had an operation. And she wasn't doing too well. She lived another, <laughs> another, 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 another 18 years after that. But uh, I've been gone all those years and I decided, well, I'm gonna go spend the summer with my folks in Montreal. And in the summertime, they go. There was a campground with a lake. It was real nice, out of the city, you know. So I figured I'll go spend some time. I've been gone since I was 15. Well, I've been home once a year, but 
you know, living at home, staying, spending time with them for three, four months, you know. So I, I came to Montreal and uh, Dino Bravo and uh, Gino Brito were the promoters. So I called the office and I said, listen, if you can use me one day a week, two days a week, you know, no spending money. That way I'm on vacation, doesn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. you know. Plus I can write off the trip sure. on my taxes. You know, because I'm there as business, even though I only work once a week. You know, so anyway, it was convenient. So I call. Oh, yeah, 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 great. Well, <laughs> Jimmy was in Minnesota, and we never kept in touch. Yeah. Never have. We ne even today, I haven't seen him in, I don't know, I, I can't remember the last time. His wife was from uh, uh, North Bay, Ontario is 350 miles from Montreal. But he wanted to go spend the summer, she wanted to go spend the summer with her parents in North Bay. So Jimmy said, well, ah, maybe I can get booked in Montreal, write the trip, my taxes, pick up some spending money, you know, it's only 350 miles, go for a couple of shots, come back to North Bay. Without even talking, we're doing the same thing. <laughs> so Gino and, 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 and Dino, they put two and two together. They said, hey, we can use these guys because him and I had never teamed up up there, you know, never. As a matter of fact, in your own town, you never do good. You know, I had wrestled a little bit years and years ago, very short period, in and out, and because uh, you know they don't want local guys. Well, they they booked it. Well, they talked to the Rujos, Raymond and Jacques. Well, their father and their uncle were big, big name in Montreal, probably bigger than Hulk Hogan. I mean, huge. Like, you ever heard of Yvonne Robert? Mm -hmm. He was a god up there, you know. In the 50s, <laughs> Carpentier, Yvonne Robert, they were, these guys were. So they decide that they're going to put the Garvins against the Rujos. And Precious is the valley, the manager. Okay. So we go to the forum. And it drew. Drew a big house. And uh, what happened is we attacked them. Jimmy had the spray, and I attacked one, one of the Rougeos, the other one. Anyway, I come off the top rope with a big knee drop. Anyway, we crippled them. They're laying there, man, and it looked like a bomb that went off in the form. Well, the dad, which is at the time was probably 60 years old, was sitting at ringside. You know, retired, you know. He's a big guy, Jacques Sr., you know, real nice fellow. Tall, six, probably 6'5", six, 6'4". Six, Six six out of big tall guy. He jumped in the ring to help his sons. Well, I put the boots to him and came off the top rope and knee dropped him across the throat about two or three times. And anyway, all three of them are laying there, man. People are dumbfounded. These guys are the superstars, and here they are laying there like, you know, just like a bomb had went off in the forum. And that was all we needed to do. The rest of the summer, everywhere we went was sold out. And I said, we didn't do anything for this. How many times you try to draw money, you know, and you pick your brains and you do this. It's just that the chemistry was so good. And I've got a tape of it. It's, it's one of my favorite. <coughs> Excuse me. It was unbelievable. Everywhere we went, all over the province. I was up there for the whole summer, three, three, three and a half months. I left, I believe, in the middle of uh, September. Jimmy stayed, because they, I didn't want to stay. I, uh, Vince was taking over up there, too. He had taken over, he was trying to take over in Atlanta, and, you know, so anyway, I didn't want to be involved in that. But I left, but uh, what a summer. And uh, the blow off was at the Montreal Forum, at the, when, before we left, the biggest crowd ever in the Montreal Forum, never been broken. That's a record. I mean, it was in the paper, and it's, I didn't believe it, but it's a fact. Hmm. Even Vince, nobody's ever broken. Nobody. Biggest crowd. Of course, you know, you can put more people in hockey, because you got the ice that's filled with people. That place was so packed. It was unbelievable. Made the headlines all over Montreal, the newspapers, record crowd, blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah, it was just unbelievable. Another area I want to talk about, because this is, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a younger fan here, and, and the first exposure I had to Ronnie Garvin was pretty much working for Jim Crockett. What, what are some of the early memories of you working for uh, the Crockett family? 
Crockett, I came here the first time, I think. I can't remember, 60. I want to say 66 came here. I know I didn't stay long. I think it was in the winter time. I think it was in the winter time. I think I stayed very, very short period. But then I came back, I think it's, I was here in 68. I remember 68. I remember that I was here. And uh, again, I think it was winter time because in the summer I, I went to North Bay. Because I was in Canada, the summers of 65, 6, 7, 8, 9. So I was here in 68 and then I came back, I think in 70 with Terry and then I came back in 72 by myself because the old man wanted me he, he told me Mr. Crockett he, he says I have nothing against Terry but he says I like you as a single and that's what I did so 70 is really the 68 I was in and out you know just a short period mm -hmm. were you born then? 73 oh see so 72 you weren't born either 73 you were just born I was here, and uh, no, I, was, I left the end of, beginning of 73, the end of 72. That's when the, the deal with uh, Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. I went to Tennessee. And then I came back in 76, and then that's when I really got shafted. Yeah. And that's when I really told. T tell us about that story, because I've heard stories of it. Well, uh, Crockett. I came in 76, and I had, I had my own airplane. And it's amazing uh, how jealous some people get. And I know this, I, I, I wasn't stupid, you know, which I didn't care. People envy other people. You know? and I was flying around, you know, 300 miles, those guys are riding in cars, I was home in an hour and a half, you know. They were riding for six hours. So I had a plane full all the time. Then Wahoo liked to fly with me. So Wahoo would like to play golf. Wahoo and I always got along. I always liked Wahoo. You, know, you, you knew where you stood with Wahoo. You, know, you told it the way it is. <laughs> That's what I like about him. <laughs> Sometimes you didn't like what he said, but you know, nothing like speaking the truth, you know. And uh, we'd go to Norfolk, and the next night, I think Norfolk was on Thursday, the next night would be in Richmond. Well, it's only like 90 miles, I think. So most of the guys would hop over to Norfolk, spend the night, wrestle there. Wahoo wanted to come back. I'm paying for the plane. He paid for the whole plane. Yeah. Nah, he was a big spender. He didn't care. He wanted to play golf the next day. So he'd fly back, which was fine with me because I got to sleep in my bed. Mm -hmm. And he would pay for all the expense for the plane. Was it, was it that much more? I mean, obviously today it's ridiculously expensive to fly a plane. But well, was it was it? expensive then yeah. compared to what we were making. Yeah. yeah. But I always had the full. The seats were always full. So, you know, it didn't cost me anything. And uh, so we come back home. And I know they created a lot of, you know, a lot of guys, you know, you could, you could, you could sense that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and then I had a, this girl picked me up at the airport quite a few times, and then I heard she was with the, she was with the Booker, the Booker's girl or something, I don't know. So that probably created some heat. And then we had this scuffle with uh, me and Conway, Tiger Conway, with the Poffles in Columbia. I don't know if you ever heard about that, but anyway, there was a little fight outside the ring there. It was a real fight. And uh, so anyway, there was a lot of heat. And so I figured, well, uh, I was partners with Tiger a little bit too, and Nelson Royal. So I decided, well, it's time to leave. I had wrestled with uh, Greg Guy in Atlanta three or four times earlier, you know, like in, like in 74, I think. And uh, he always told me, man, he says, if you ever make it to, to uh, Minneapolis, man, you'll make some money. Well, I kind of knew I'd make money because I'd be wrestling this, I'd be wrestling him a lot. Mm -hmm. you know? So you wrestle the, the son of the owner. And, you'll be you in know. a good spot. Yeah. So I said, well, maybe it's time to go to Minnesota. I always try to stay away from the north because I didn't like the north because of the weather. Yeah, but I figured, hey, money, you know. So I call. Oh yeah, man, we got a spot for you. Well, but I got booked just like that, you know. I mean, you know, I didn't need any more than you. What I, you know, didn't need to send a resume, you know. So I 
was nice enough. I give uh, Crockett three weeks notice, I think, you know, instead of two, I said, yeah, three weeks, you know. But I told him, I says, hey, I, you're not going to beat me on no television. And the house shows, I don't care. You know, beat me every night, I don't give a shit. You know. Well, <laughs> first week went by. Then they called me in the office. They conned me. George Scott was a booker. And George says, you know, he says, uh, we'd like you to do a job for Angelo Mosca on TV. And by the way, doing a job is you lose. In case some people don't know that. <laughs> so I figured, you know, Angelo's 300 pound guy, ex football player. Yeah, why not? You know, just trying to be nice. I should have said, hell no, you don't walk out, you know. But I uh, just, you know, I liked Angelo, you know, and I figured, yeah, this guy's 300 pounds, man, you know. He's an athlete, you know, he played football, he's a big old rough, tough guy, you know. Okay, we went to Raleigh. And we wrestled for 20 minutes, man. He made me look like I was, you know, man, I, I took the whole match. And then he beat me. And about another four or five days went by. And then I heard something. I didn't believe it at first. Angelo, it was a week later. Angelo was going to Minneapolis. And he sent the tape to Minneapolis. Hmm. He was going a week before me, or two weeks before me. And he sent a tape beating somebody. They played it up there, didn't even look at the tape. They just thought it was a job guy, you know, just, you know. So I called up there and I canceled. Oh, it's not gonna hurt you. I cancel, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming. And then I went to the office and I told him off, you know, and I said, I'm out of here. And Crockett said, don't burn your bridges. I said, I'm not burning my bridge. I'm blowing up the son of a bitch. And I never thought I'd be back, never. If somebody would have told me that in 1987 I would have been the world's champion in Jim Crockett's office, I would have bet at anything I own. Yeah. You just never know what happens you know, down the road. So I went home. I said, I'm, I'm not finishing my week's notice. I'm gone. You know, they all kissed my hoo hoo, you know. So they, even Wahoo came to the house. Oh man, I finished the week, blah, 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 blah. Well, the motivation, wow, is because he wanted me to fly with, you know. <laughs> and the office probably, yeah. And I said, no, I'm gone. And I left. I left and I went, that's when I went to Knoxville. Did, did very well in Knoxville. I had five, four and a half, five years, what a run. Great. I heard a, a story, and it may not be in Knoxville, that uh, a promoter screwed you over on, uh, some pay and then you went on the local TV show and kind of exposed the business just to hurt the promoter to get even with him. No, we didn't uh, We didn't really do that. But was that Knoxville? Yeah, you seem yeah to we were going to expose it, but we never showed it. We went to a TV station and all four of us and we, we, didn't, we made a tape. Uh, that was plan B, but we never used it. So it's just give, giving you some leverage. Yeah, there was Malenko, Roop, Ort, and myself. Uh, Malenko, Rube Orton, and Ron Wright. Yeah, yeah, we went to the studio in the middle of the night, did a tape. Yeah, we called it Plan B. <laughs> <laughs> Plan B. Uh, well, I could go on and on and on, man. I probably, I probably could talk for 25 hours. I got more stuff. I mean, it's amazing. The more you talk, the more you remember. You start. Oh, well, there's so much happens in 30 years. Yeah. You know, 30 years, I mean, you know, I, I remember in North Bay, the, the career, I, five summers, those are the greatest summers you could ever have. Greatest summers. I got stories from North Bay, I mean, it was, a, it's just, you know, it was great times. It was great times. I'd do my life all over again the same. I wouldn't change anything. But tell I, us I always said that. I was the luckiest person, you know. Hey. But the same, you know why I was so lucky? Because I, I have never... Never, never, never done anything I didn't like. Uh, and that's why it's hard for me to understand people that complain all the time. Leave. Do something else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're unhappy one day, you've lost that day. Two days, three days, five years, three. You've lost everything. You know? Leave. Find something else. Do something else. 
They hate their boss. Just leave. You're not going to change the boss. You're not going to change the company you work for. And wrestling was the same thing. There was guys that were miserable every night in the dressing room. There were guys, man, they were down all the time. All of, and, and you get that in every business. They're never happy. You make 10 grand a week, they're not happy. They make 20, they're not happy. You know, they make nothing, they're still, I mean, you know, don't make nothing, yeah, but leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I never understood that part about how humans just think there's nothing else. Yeah. Well, my family is here, my dis is here. I've been, my, my dad worked there for 30 years. Who, gives a, who cares what your dad, you know? Happiness to me is the most important. You know, waking up happy, doing things, and going. It's like now, I fly a couple of days away. I'm happy, man. I get in the sky, I'm happy. I work when I want to. Yeah. If I don't want to work, I'm going to hunt. I'm always doing something. You know, you don't, you, you know, you sit idling, you know, you get old. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit idle, you just get old. I think you age faster. You're stressed, you age faster. To me, stress is, you've got total control of it. You know, you've got total control of your stress. You have stress, get rid of it. I call it the, 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 the elimination, the process of elimination. You lined up the problems and you start at the top and you go zoom, zoom, zoom. If it takes you a week to eliminate the first one, but you work at it, eliminate every one of them. Until there's zero, you know? It's like you see people, they're pissed off at people all the time. Well, don't pay, don't, don't even visit them. Don't call them. Don't associate with them. You have control of all your friends, your activity, from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. You know? That's why I don't watch TV. TV tells you how to live your life. And I'm going, I don't need nobody telling me how to live my life. I'm happier than these people. I'm, I guarantee I'm happier than Dr. Phil. <laughs> I would bet anything in the world. This guy is nothing. He's not a success. He's a failure in life. He's a success, success now. You know, because Oprah Winfrey put him where he's at. You know, and he's cashing in on these poor idiots that's got all these problems. Right? I mean, all these people go to Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil ain't nothing. This, this Dr. Phil has nothing. You know, the guy has, to me, he's a failure. He's, he's not a failure at the moment because somebody else put him in a situation that he's ripping off people. Mm -hmm. He's cashing in on that. Same thing as wrestling, politics. There we go back again. Yeah. Preachers are successful. Why? Because there's so many people afraid to die. Mm -hmm. Why are you afraid to die? I'm 61 mm -hmm. years old. I've had 61 years to get ready. To get ready. I'm going near the end of my life. You mean I'm not smart enough to understand that? There's somebody on the planet not smart enough to understand that you're going, you know, once you pass middle age, you're going towards the end. You know, when you're born, you're, you're you, well, actually when you're born, you're dying from the time you're born. Mm -hmm. It might take 75 years, but you're going towards death. Some people never realize that. They need these shrinks. They need these, they need therapy. Why, what does people need therapy for? Why don't they look in the mirror and talk to themselves? Am I happy? What's my problem? Make a list, start writing, have a tape recorder, whatever. You know, fix your own life. You don't need somebody to do that. The same thing as saving money. There's people that couldn't care less about saving money. They make 10,000, they'll blow 10 grand. They make 100 grand, they'll blow 10, 100 grand. Go figure, you know, and then they get old and they're, they're unhappy. Well, they're unhappy because they created all of it. My dad always said, you're gonna, you make the bed you're laying. If it's not comfortable, who made it? You know, we, we do every day. People in relationships, man, they're just, you know, they're so confused. <laughs> it's nothing really confusing if you stop and use your, you know, what the good Lord give you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> to me, the most prevailing thing in, in, in life, common sense. And I think they quit making that. Yeah, because people depend on all these little trinkets now. The computer thinks for them. This thinks for them. That thinks for them. I refuse to go along with that. Uh, I, I'm not a computer smart guy, you know. I can get on it, you know, navigate a little bit, you know, and everything. But I refuse to totally put my life into hours and hours and get on the Internet and chat with people. What, what a waste of life. So what do, what do you use the computer for? 
Uh, keep in touch with a couple of buddies now and then. You know, uh, when I need something, I needed a car parts the other day. I got a heck of a price on it. You know, I got it. Took me forever to get to it, but I found it. You know, uh, if I need to check the weather, you know, but I'm not a. I don't spend much time on it. Very little. Very, very, very little. Because uh, you know, people, are, uh, and I. I say that because that's why there are, people are out of shape. They're not exercising. They're not doing anything. They're sitting for hours at a computer. You know, and even my poor kid. You know, my kid. I, I tell him, I said, you know, it's like you go to a store, and uh, an article costs uh, an article costs a, a dollar and eight cents. Okay, try that next time. I do it on purpose too, especially when they're young, behind the cash register. They just come out of high school, some college. They're supposed to be smart. Dollar and eight cents. I give them a dollar and a quarter. Some don't know how much change I got coming. You mess them up. Yeah. If they don't look on the cash register, what the change is, they can't figure it out for themselves. If you don't give them the right amount, man, I tell you what, you throw them. You throw them for a loop. I mean, just, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yeah. With the space limitations we have, we're not going to be able to cover everything about your career. But I do want to, just so we, just so we don't don't forget about it, because a lot of people will be disappointed if we didn't get your words about it. You had the, you know, the probably the peak of your careers. You had a you had a victory over Ric Flair, and you held the most important belt in wrestling. Can you mm -hmm. just give us some some of your memories of that time? Well, it was uh, it was good. It was uh, you know it was business, you know, and uh, the only reason it happened is because uh, I know Dusty was against it, you know. Dusty was the booker, and Flair liked to work with me, you know. I liked to work with him because the guy was he's good. He was in good shape, you know. You could go, you know, you'd have to worry about the guy blowing up, and and I mean what he did looked good, and he was uh, I was like Larry Rick. Rick was. And uh, he liked me, and we had chemistry together. You know, we had good matches. We what, good what was the rationale of? Uh, I mean, because it was a short title run, and it was kind of unexpected. Well, I would have been longer. As Dusty made That's sure that it didn't happen longer than that. I didn't even get a return match. Right. And okay. that's automatic. Anywhere you, I've been in the business thirty years. Anywhere you went, anywhere you went, the two guys that wrestled for the belt, they had rematches all around all the cities. Never had one. Never had one. You know. So everything was the booker had a lot to do with the business. Yeah, but it's like a script in a movie. If I'm the writer and I write you out of the script, you're out of a job. I don't care how good of an actor you are, how good you you know, you're you you've been written off. You know. So or or they kill you, you know. So yeah, that's what happened. Had you heard the comments that Ric Flair put in the book about about uh, the title run? No. He had mentioned that they really liked you chasing him, but once you got it, the fans kind of they didn't like it anymore because they they liked to see you chase him, but they didn't they didn't like you as the champion. They said so well because Dusty made sure that. See, I never once I won the belt, I didn't wrestle for a month. Didn't want me to defend the title. So what are you going to do? You know, you're the champion. You're supposed to defend the title. See, everything is controlled with a pen. Sure. You know, so, you know. So this was a case, Dust, Dusty's ego, and he didn't want somebody else maybe. Well, I'll tell you what. If they weren't interested, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you. I'll explain something to you. And I didn't care because I knew the end of my career was coming, and I was gone. You know, I didn't need the business. A lot of guys need the business because they're broke. You know, they need it. They need to suck to the promoter. You know, they need to, you know, because that's the way it is. I mean, I'm, I'm stating the facts. And after that, I'll tell you what happened. I didn't get a return match. So I just sat back and I waited and to see what happened. So Dusty says, uh, you know, in his, the way he talks, you know, you're going to knock out the, the dream, he says. Well, he's done dreamed up some because I beat all the four horsemen. Every one of them. I fought all four of them. You know, and Dusty never has. So I knew that Dusty's ego was 
Yeah. Well, that's, that was the problem back then is having a booker that wrestled. Booker should have never wrestled. Never involved himself. You know, just use the talent. That's why Vince is successful. You know, all these main stars, he's, he's not, you know, he's not the one involved. He has involved himself, you know, but it took a long, long time. And he puts himself out of it. So anyway, he comes up with this great idea. Well, I won two titles, maybe three, in Baltimore. Baltimore was my town. I was over, man, shit, I'd walk in that place, man, I was like a god in there. So he's going to have me knock him out in Baltimore. I'm a baby face. He wants me to knock him out. Oh, he says, you'll fight your way out of the ring. People will be so mad. Said, it's going to backfire. No, man, the dream. You're going to knock the dream out. Well, I, well, okay. I'm like, I never argue. I said, what have I got to lose? Well, when we go to Baltimore, what happened is he put a bounty on him. Okay. What's his name? Gary Hart was the manager. So he's going to put me partners with Perez. Remember Perez? And Gary Hart's going to be the manager. And we're going to wrestle Dusty. You see that? I beat the four horsemen. Now, Dusty beating me alone is not enough. He don't want to beat just me that I, I beat the four horsemen. He wants to beat me, Perez, and Gary Hart. So now it's going to make me a Superman. It's going to make him a Superman. You follow me? Yeah, you, you follow the picture? Okay. okay, so we go there, and he had Gary Hart put a bounty on him, and nobody knew who was going to collect the bounty. $5,000. And I forgot who he wrestled, but the match was over, or near over some anyway. I walked to the ring. People didn't know why I was walking to the ring, and I tapped him on the shoulder, and when he turned around, I knocked him out. And he lay there for 10 minutes. People cheer. 30% maybe booed. There's some people booed, but 70% cheer. I knew it didn't get over. You know, they didn't give a shit mm -hmm. about him. You know. But see, the eagle, the he thought, I guess, I don't know. But you know, and when you stand back and you look, and I, I'm not saying anything bad against Dusty. That was, uh, he had the pen and he did what he wanted, and personally, I couldn't care less. But I, I'm not stupid, you know. I see things, you know, I observe, I watch. And I said, well, what the hell? You know, that's what he's going to do, you know. So there's no more money for me here. You follow me? I should have had 15, 20 returns in all the major cities. That would have been money, big bucks. You know, that happened. You know, and people would have paid to see it. You know, they would have paid to see it. So what happened is after that happened, I walked to the, I was, we were booked at the somewhere, going somewhere to Atlanta for TV or something. I got on the airplane and I shook hands with all the guys and I showed up at the airport just for that the private plane. I shook guys with the guys that was in the airplane. There was two planes. And I said, boys, I'll see you. Don't know when, but I'll see you all somewhere. They thought I was joking. I walked off the plane, went home. That was the last. And Dusty went on TV, and you can check. I'm sure they got tapes of it. He said he beat me up in a bar. That's the story. Because he didn't have a tape. So he beat me up in a bar. Yeah, and that was the end. That was the end. I never, I never went back to NWA after that. You know, what you turn out better? I had a hell of a deal in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. For uh, Colon? Yeah, I uh, went over there, beat him for the belt. I had a good run. Give me good, paid good money. Oh, well, I just went on the weekend, Friday, Saturday. Came back on Sunday or Monday. You know, then I went to the WWF later, but everything turned out fine. You know. We'll bring you but back. that was the reason, you know, and a lot of people never understood it. Well, you know, if you don't know the, what's supposed to happen, you know. But the whole thing was based on on, on ego. If, if Dusty wouldn't have been there, we would have went all the way around. Mm -hmm. We would have made money with it. And another thing that killed that show is, uh, and this is this is true. I mean, you can research it. It was Starcade, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you look back in history, where was Starcade at? Greensboro. Exactly. Greensboro was sellout, man. Three levels. You ever been to that building? Mm -hmm. It was awesome. Three levels sold out. That, where did we go that night? Which one was it? Chicago. 87, Chicago. Yeah. Exactly. 
and it was at Atlanta, two places, but the live show was, it was a disaster. Why do we leave? We're here. This is local. Greensboro was dead after that. Never was any good. Greensboro, they destroyed Greensboro. They did. People in Greensboro felt left out totally. Starcade was a Greensboro tradition. Whose idea was it to go to Chi Town? I leave you three guesses. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was it to go in Vince McMahon's backyard? Why do you find a man in his backyard? We had Baltimore. We had won that. But we didn't need to go to Philly. We didn't need to go to these other places. We didn't have them. Baltimore, we got it. By luck, maybe. But Baltimore was the NWA town. It was. Big houses. Packed. I wrestled Ted DiBiase. Beat him for the bill. That I, 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 I was a hell of a town. You know. But, you know. And who, whose idea you think it was to... I have two jets, I mean two airplanes. You know, uh, you know, if we go down the, the, get down the list, you know, you know, which I didn't care because I didn't own the business. But I, I saw a lot of things coming. You know, a lot of things coming. You, know, you got to take little steps when you fight Vince McMahon. Little steps. If I... If I had to say, if we were doing a documentary saying this is the, uh, the the decline or the downfall of the Crockett era, the Crockett family promotion, would, would you be able to assign blame to anyone other than Dusty? Well, it's their blame, too. And I'm not saying anything well, again against Dusty. Dusty was looking for Dusty, right. okay? Uh, would I have been the booker? I might have done the same thing. I don't know. I've never been in a position like that. But I think it's a big mistake to... And that's why what the downfall of a lot of promotion is to have a booker that's involved. What, what was I going to say is, is uh, Crockett, the way I looked at it, I stand back out of the picture and look at what was going on then. Crockett was mesmerized by uh, Dusty. He thought Dusty couldn't do any, no wrong. I, I, I do believe that. Until it was too late. Do you think most of the boys uh, looked at him and, and said, man, what is he thinking? Or do you think because the houses were so good and they saw the business so good, they said, well, maybe he's right. Maybe given. Yeah, but you, you book 30 guys on a card and you sell out and you don't make any money. What good is it? Mm -hmm. You put 15 guys on a card and bring some money to the office, that's talent. That's 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 business. That's yeah. I think you you just ran out of money. You, you know you just can't keep on going to these houses. There was a disaster at the end. You know, like all these uh, uh, bashes. There were disasters. Some of them. There were some good ones, but on the overall, I think it was a disaster. You know, we didn't need that. If we would have concentrated. In the area that we were solid and strong, it'd still be going. It would still be going. But, but you know, it's just like a war. When you spread out, you get weak. And when you go to these different cities, you know, we went to some of those cities, they didn't want to see us there. They didn't give a shit about Dusty Rhodes or Ronnie Garvin or, or any of us, you know. I mean, a few fans, but I'm talking about the May, you know, it was WWF territory. It's just like WWF didn't come in our territory. Did you notice that? How smart they was? And here we are, chasing them. And who had the most money? Blah. <laughs> Genius. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a businessman, and I can see that stuff, you know. I, uh, I'm going, wow. You know, Vince McMahon didn't leave and go fight somebody. He waited on them, you know. Nah, it was an ego, you know. It was an ego. You know, we all have a certain amount of ego, you know. But I know, I'm sure Dusty knows, you know. Like, but like I say, he's not the only one in the business that that uh, that that booked himself in in wrestle. And I, I don't think it was good. You know, I, I think you 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 put yourself out of it. You could always wrestle maybe underneath, 
or maybe in, involve yourself once, like Vince did, you know, once a year, twice a year, you know, but get out, mm -hmm. you know, where everything is wrapped up and revolves around you. That's not good. That's not good, you know. It, it, I think people get tired of it, and it's not good for your talent. Talent starts seeing. I mean, you know, it's just, I've saw it. How many other guys seen it? Maybe some guys, somebody else, don't want to uh, talk about it. But I, I speak the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I speak of what I see. <laughs> you know, it's not a hearsay. I mean, it happened to me. They're just like when I had in '76. What happened to me when they screwed me? You know, well, that's my story, and I stick to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Garvin, like a good wrestler, uh, we've we've kind of. Uh, taking advantage of all the time that we promised we would use, yet there's still so much more that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about. So, like a good wrestler, I think you left yourself up for a return match <laughs> here on camera. <laughs> but we want to thank you, and I didn't give you a proper introduction before because we just, as soon as I turned these cameras on, you, you know, yeah. you just started right away. We want to thank you for that. Thank you for sharing some stories here. It was a pleasure. And we'll, do a, pleasure. we'll do a part two uh, very soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.